Welcome everyone. We are at the back edge of the Christmas season and I had an experience over the, the Christmas holidays that, that was so shocking, so astounding, so troubling that I, I felt like I needed to share it with you. And so we're going to do that today, but, but first I, I want to say that it, it's my prayer my honest and sincere prayer that the message of this video be received as, as my heart is delivering it. You see, this is not at all about being contentious, about fighting and battling amongst ourselves. It is simply a question of who is God? How can we know him? How can we be reconciled with him? And so with with that in mind and and hoping that you will keep that in the in the, in the focus of your eye as we go through this i pray that we will be able to together find jesus christ the year after i left mormonism that was 3 years ago i was invited to attend the the christmas party at my old mormon ward and at that time, the Bishop Rock Perman told me that if I came, I would be prosecuted, that, that, that the law would be called and, and that I would be prosecuted for trespassing. And that has been shocking to me for a long time. This is a celebration of Messiah. And why would anyone prevent anyone from joining in that celebration? But that's that's what we had. That's what we faced. And and so I made it a point that year and every year since, this was my third year, to take invitations to our little church's Christmas concert and walk for, to the different homes in our ward, talk to the different people in our ward, and specifically to focus on those who have taken an active role in persecuting and prosecuting me for crimes that that just never happened. So just about a week before Christmas, I stopped by the home of Rock Perman. He became the bishop of my old ward shortly after I left Mormonism. And I, I wanted to visit with him and invite him to this concert. And as we talked, he said something that puzzled me. He said, I am the man who can help you. And I, I didn't know what he meant. And and he said it two or three times, and I asked for clarification, and he said, well, I'm the stake president, and if you would like to fix the things that have separated you from the church, I can help you do that. Now, I don't know exactly what he means by this. I don't know what his offer entails. But I do know that I have missed weddings and farewells and missionary homecomings. I have missed funerals and baby blessings, uh, both in my family and among my dear friends. And this breaks my heart because I love these people. And I have no intention of causing any type of a disturbance uh, inside any Mormon church activity. And I won't do that. That's, that's not my way. But I've missed these things and they have been hurtful. And Rock Perman told me, he said, I'm, I'm the stake president. I can now make these changes. And I thought, well, wow, wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, I will never be Mormon again. I will never recognize it as the true church. I will never recognize the authority of its priesthood. But I wouldn't mind having peace with the church, at least to the degree that the next family wedding I can attend. I think that would be a nice thing. As we discussed his offer, he made a, a statement that was shocking, astounding to me. Uh, and it was a justification for all that had been done in the name of the church against me. He said, you know how much I believe in priesthood keys. Well, what are priesthood keys? The Bible doesn't mention them. But he, he spoke of priesthood keys. And I remember as a Mormon believing that there were priesthood keys. Who holds the priesthood keys? Mormon doctrine teaches that Jesus held the keys and that he gave those keys to Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that during the great apostasy sometime after the death of the 
original 12 apostles that these keys and priesthood power were lost, and so they had to be restored by Joseph Smith. And so Peter, James, and John, who received those keys on the Mount of Transfiguration, came down to Joseph Smith and gave him the, the Melchizedek priesthood and the priesthood keys. He restored those to him. That, that is the Mormon belief. And because the Mormon people believe so strongly in priesthood keys, these keys, though, though no one has really identified what they are, I was never clear on what they were, they kind of elevate people almost toward the position of deity. And as deity, the church is taught continually that Mormon leaders, especially the prophet, can never lead the people astray, that we must always, always follow those who have priesthood keys. The last time I attended a Mormon church in Rockland, Idaho, in my home ward, Rock Perman spoke during the sacrament meeting, and I remember that he specifically singled out the youth and said, I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to you, the youth of the church. And he made them a promise. He says, I promise you that if you will always keep your eye on and follow Bishop Bart Ralphs and stake president Garn Lovell, you will never be led astray. See, this is priesthood keys. They, they put so much faith in men. What I don't recall is that Rock Perman ever mentioned Jesus. And it's interesting to me that that this particular talk that he delivered at church that day was instrumental in helping me make a decision that I had to leave Mormonism in order that I might follow and worship God. The two just seem to be separated. As we talk about priesthood keys, I want to go back through history, but I don't want to spend a lot of time there. It's, it's, a, it's a negative point for a lot of the Mormon people, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but it is important that we touch on some of this. Joseph Smith, just before his death, he said, What a thing it is for a man to be accused of committing adultery and having seven wives. I can only find one. I, I find this interesting because this is, this is not some third-party thing. This is found in the History of the Church, Volume 6, page 411. And the thing that's astounding to me is that if we go to LDS.org, it will confirm to us that at the time Joseph Smith died, he had as many as 40 wives. And so we know that as he stood before the church and declared that he had but one wife, there were as many as 40 of his wives sitting in the pews as he denied them priesthood keys. About that same time in his life, he wrote, I have more to boast of than ever any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep the whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, nor John, nor Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints have never run away from me yet. Do you, do you see what's happening here? This man with priesthood keys, he made a list of people. He listed apostles and he started at the top and listed apostle, 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 apostle. At the bottom of the list, he put Jesus. And then he elevated himself above them all. And because he had priesthood keys, the church members never questioned him or challenged him on this. On September 11th, 1857, men with priesthood keys ordered other priesthood holders, some who held Mormon priesthood keys, to ride to Mountain Meadows and shoot, stab, hack, and beat 120 men, women, and children to death. Why, why would these Mormon men go do this? The answer is simple. It's priesthood keys. Now, my question is, if Rock Perman had lived in Cedar City, Utah, 
in 1857, would he have rode to Mountain Meadows and pulled the trigger? I think the facts already established that he would have because of priesthood keys. When we lean on priesthood keys, truth becomes irrelevant. We just follow men no matter what they say. History is full of examples. But how, how do I know that Rock Perman would have rode to Mountain Meadows? You see, Rock Perman threatened legal action against me if I simply attended a celebration of Christ's birth. Rock Perman was, was a lead part of an effort that landed me in criminal court because my wife and I attended the funeral of a 20-year friend and left peaceably when we were asked. Rock Perman placed guards at the doors of his Rockland, Idaho, Mormon church house. He kept them there for over a year, and he told the people that they were necessary so that they could be protected against me, a man who has never, ever threatened or taken any action to disturb any Mormon meeting. See, I won't do that. The Constitution of the United States guarantees us all a right to worship. And, and, and I will not violate that, ever. Rock Perman allowed High Priest Brian Lee to escalate the false witness against me to the degree that he said that I had threatened to go into schools and churches and use violence to hurt small Mormon children. Rock Perman allowed that to go unchallenged. In every case, audio recordings prove that I have been falsely accused. And Rock told me that he has not listened to those audio recordings. That may be true, may not be, I don't, I don't know. But what I do know is the truth is available for Rock Perman, who was acting as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, as a bishop with priest of keys. The truth was available to him, and he chose not to look to the truth because he followed men with priesthood keys. So would Rock Perman have rode to Mountain Meadows and murdered? I, I think he would have. But what about those people in the Mormon church who once called me brother, friend, neighbor, and now believe, they hear, and they repeat, and they act on the false witnesses that have been born against me? Would they have been willing to ride to Mountain Meadows and pull the trigger? I, I believe they would. You see, I, I'm going to explain this and I'm going to support this. But the fact of the matter is, if we are willing to harm a brother while ignoring the truth, what won't we do? I will come back to support the statement that they would have ridden to Mountain Meadows in a minute. But first, I want to cover a few things. I want to talk about the gospel. What is the gospel? The third article of faith says, We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to laws and ordinances of the gospel. So that's the Mormon gospel. It says that they will be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Well, I would ask any Mormon, can you list those? Can you provide me a list of every law and every ordinance that must be perfectly followed in order to live the gospel of Mormonism? And they can't do it. There is no list. Ezra Taft Benson taught, the law of the gospel embraces all laws, principles, and ordinances necessary for our exaltation. What are they? You see, the Mormon people don't know, and my question would be, how can you live according to a standard that you can't even define? Now, the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that it has been defined, and we can understand it. We can, we can list it. We can, we can dissect its components, and we can live by it. We find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. It's Paul speaking. And he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye are also saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. 
For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's it. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we remember that Christ died for us for all of our sins, and that through him and through him alone we can be saved. That he was buried. That evil thought it had won, and they buried him, they placed him in a tomb. And that three days later, he rose as we will rise in Christ. That is so good news. But I want to point out a few parts here. You see, Paul says, Moreover, I declare unto you the gospel. This is a declaration. This is a formal, legal document that Paul put in his letter and it found its way into the word of God. I declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, wherein ye stand. You see, this gospel is the substance upon which the church of Christ, the Christians, stood it was, it was the hill they were willing to die on. There's other things that aren't that important. But the gospel of Christ is where we make our last stand. We put a banner in the ground and we stand there. And it says, by which also ye are saved. You see, we stand on it because that is what saves us. That is what redeems us. That is what reconciles us with God. And that is what leads to eternal life with God. We can follow it because we can list it. We can define it. We can understand it. Paul spoke again to the Galatians. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, he said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I have said before, I say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than which ye have received, let him be accursed. There's some key things here, you see. Paul says, live by the gospel that I have already delivered to you because he says there is no other, verse seven. He goes on and he says, there are some that come and trouble you and pervert the gospel. You see, I have shared with you the Mormon gospel and I have shared with you the gospel from the Bible. They are not the same. So they are another gospel. And finally, I would say, that if we or an angel from heaven should preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. And this was such an important point that Paul repeated it. He said it twice. He said, I'd say again, if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you any other gospel, let him be accursed. Rock, your gospel is different from Paul's gospel. And if the Bible is true, and I can prove to you that it is, then Mormonism and all who preach it must be accursed. Not my words. These are the words of Paul. And Paul didn't speak his words. He spoke the words of Jesus Christ. I want to talk a little bit about the law. One of the favorite biblical passages for the Mormon people is that faith without works is dead. And, and they stand on that, that, that their works are important, that their works save them. But we have to read all of James in context. We have to understand what James was trying to say. So if we back up just, just 16 verses, we will read James saying this. He said, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of it all. You see, we cannot keep the whole law, can we? We just can't do it. And so if we, if we try to be justified by what, what did your article of faith say? By obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. If that is our attempt, if that is our mission, if that is our objective, and we stumble on one point, then we are guilty of everything. And so the fact of the matter is, you stumble, I stumble, we stumble. And so 
Are we guilty of, of even things so serious as riding to Mountain Meadows and pulling a trigger against small children? You see, we are. We stumble on one point. We're guilty of all of it. And, and, and so we are guilty of this. But there is a difference. Those who stand on the principle of priesthood keys justify those actions. And those who stand on Jesus Christ fall before him with their face in the dirt and they cry, God, forgive me. And it says, we're guilty of all. So if we stumble on one point, we're not just equally guilty with those at Mountain Meadows. We are guilty with those who cried out, crucify him, and took Jesus to the cross. And even then, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. So, so we have to be doing the works of God. John 6, 29 tells us that the work of God is simply that we believe Jesus Christ. That's it. We believe on him and allow him to come into us through the Holy Spirit. Make us new creations. So anyway, now we're, we're talking about the law. After I visited the home of Rock Perman and invited him to the concert that he didn't come to, I went to the home of a friend. I'm not going to name her. But I went to her home, and as we spoke about this, there was a point where somehow the conversation prompted me, and I asked her, do you keep all the commandments? And she said, I do. I went, oh, that was, that was shocking to me, troubling. And, and it still is. And so I asked her again, you keep every commandment. And she said, uh, yes, I have reached the age in my life where I keep every single commandment. So Rock Perman, I would say this. As her bishop, you supported her as she served as a Mormon missionary. While, while she was literally deluding herself as she marched to hell, you supported her as a missionary. You signed a temple recommend and proclaimed her worthy. Well, I, I guess I would ask, what does God have to say about this. If we go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, we read, if we say we have fellowship with him, that's what Jesus, if we say we have fellowship with Jesus and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So here's a woman who claims to have fellowship with Jesus, but she's also claiming that she's perfect in keeping the commandments, therefore doesn't even need Jesus. How can she be in fellowship with someone that she doesn't even need? Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You see, anyone who keeps all the commandments is without sin. And, and John, the apostle John. Now, we have to remember that we've talked about John. We've talked about Paul. They had priesthood keys, according to Mormon doctrine. So you can't just write them off. So John, uh, an apostle of God who held, according to Mormon doctrine, priesthood keys, said this, 1 John chapter 1, verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You see, in professing our own worthiness, in professing our own righteousness, in professing that we are tithing worthy or temple worthy or worthy in any way, shape, or form. We, we call God a liar. First Thessalonians tells us that if we continue in this blasphemous, idolatrous thing. You see, we, we become idolaters when we place ourselves above God. We become idolaters when we say, oh, we can become a God too. We, we become idolaters when we say, oh, through the principle of eternal progression, we can, pro we can progress to the place where God is now and beyond becoming even more someday than God is today. You see, when, when we do that, Paul wrote, and for this cause, 
God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Rock, that is you. That is Mormonism. It is a strong delusion. And people believe lies. And though you are a good man and you're trying to be a good man and you're trying to follow God, you are leading people to hell. You're leading your wife, your good wife and your children to hell. So let us walk in Christ. You see, I'm going to continue doing what I do. I will reach out as I can. I will talk to people as I'm able. And I will share the good news around the Rockland Valley and beyond. Because something amazing happened in my life. And I echo the words of Paul uh, when he wrote the letter to the Galatians. Galatians 2.20, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And I say this, I died to my old prideful self. My worthy self died and I recognized my sin and I rose again with Christ. He made me a new creature. And I, I am dead. But it is Christ who lives in me. And it's, it's the most crazy cool thing that I can ever describe. Now, Rock, I have to tell you that as long as you believe Mormon doctrine, you cannot comprehend what I've just told you about becoming new. You see, your own doctrine prohibits it, and, and we can have that discussion at some other point. Rock, I would like to issue a challenge to you. This is not a challenge where I am arguing to prove myself right and to prove you wrong. No, that's, that's immaterial. It is, it is a challenge to sit with me together so that we can come to a better understanding of Jesus Christ. You see, Rock, I have come to understand that Mormon doctrine always runs aground on the rocks of Mormon doctrine. Every time it runs aground on the rocks of Mormon doctrine. And so I would invite you to sit with me. We will open only those books that you hold to be scripture. I will never tell you what to believe. I will simply point out passages, read them to you, and ask for a response. Now, Rock, if this is uneasy, uh, if this makes you a little uh, uncomfortable, I would invite you to invite all of my former Rockland bishops. Bring them all. I've been here for 20 years, so there's a number of them. You see, you five our former LDS bishops. You five claim to hold the priesthood and claim to hold the office of a high priest. You five claim to have revelation. You five claim to have discernment. You five claim to have a living prophet. You five claim to be members of the only true church. That is a significant, significant home court advantage. And I am willing to sit together with the five of you and simply have this discussion. Now, I also want to invite the people of Rockland, if any of this has rung true to you, I will sit with you. I would love to come. We can meet privately. We can meet anywhere you want. And together we can search for Christ. If you find him and you have a deeper relationship with him and find something amazing in him, that's good for you. If you discover that I'm wrong and that Mormonism is true, that's good for you too because it will strengthen your testimony. But rather than a challenge, I would like to issue an invitation. And so I would hope that we can set the challenge aside and simply work on this invitation. Rock, I'm going to continue walking in Christ. I'm going to continue sharing what I can everywhere I can. And I'm going to be bold about it. But one thing I understand is that my position is not as strong as yours, not in this community. You have the ability to reach hundreds and hundreds of people. You can do so much more than I can do. And, and it will happen when Christ indwells you, when he lives in you through the Holy Spirit. You are, you are made new. Your flesh and your pride die and you're raised with Christ. How do you do this? 
I suppose there's more ways than one, but I can only share with you the way that it happened for me and for Grace. We bought two new red letter Bibles, King James, brought them home, laid them on our kitchen table, and we knelt at the table and we prayed to God, God, we need to know the truth. God, we will, we will pay anything to know this truth. God, there's nothing that we are not willing to lose. God, if we lose our home, our cars, our lands, our jobs, that's okay. We will pay that to know the truth. God, if it costs us our friends and our associations, that's okay. We are prepared to lose that. God, if it costs us our family, and, and the hardest one of all, was to lay our children at the foot of the cross and say, God, if you require them, if you require to take them from us so that we might know, God, we need to know. We held nothing back. We just leaned on God. We trusted in God. And he is so merciful. Yes, we lost many things. Almost every friend is gone. Almost every association is gone. In the Rockland Valley, I have become that horrible man that wants to hurt small children. It doesn't matter. Because God also preserved many things. Our children, oh, we love them so much and we still have a relationship with them. But God has opened doors and we have met true believers in Christ Jesus who have this faith and this assurance that their sins are forgiven them and that they are forgiven, and that they have eternal life. You know, it's, it's amazing because the Apostle John said, he wrote these things that we may know that we have eternal life. See, we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for that judgment. We don't have to wait for the end of spirit prison and, and, and uh, paradise. We can know today that we have eternal life. And we can know that we can know that because we got that word from the Apostle John, who even according to Mormon doctrine held priest of keys. So Rock, I just encourage you to make a difference in our community. Like Moses, lead them out, free them from the bondage, set them free in Christ. Christ says the truth makes us free. Let's find the truth. And Rock, if I can help in any way, I'm here. I'm here for you, and I am here for every member of this little Rockland community because God loves you, and so do I.